Podcasting from the base of Lake Tahoe in the eastern Sierras comes the Medicine Wheel. We are a group of progressive physicians seeking solutions and enlightenment while surfing the seas of big data and summiting mountains of research in an effort to make the practice of medicine more personal and medical knowledge more accessible and empower you, the listener, to be as healthy as possible. Now, the medicine wheel. Welcome to the medicine wheel. Uh, This is our first uh, podcast, uh, which we're going to actually label Podcast Zero. I want to say welcome to all of our listeners, uh, whenever and wherever you are. Uh, A lot of times these podcasts can be accessed over time, so if we're speaking to you into the future, uh, we uh, welcome you here in the past. It's a cold winter here in the Sierras, and I'm here with one of my co-founders and partners, uh, Dr. Robert Floyd. Robert, thank you for joining us here today. I know uh, this endeavor has been interesting uh, and unusual in some ways, uh, but it's come together in a short way and and in a good way. Um, In an effort to learn more about the founders and those folks who are contributing to uh, the creation of this uh, podcast, um, we kind of want to learn more about you by going through a, a series of questions. Are you open to that? Absolutely. Great. Sounds great. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, the first thing is I want you to tell us a little bit about how you ended up in the field of medicine. I, I think you have an unusual journey, and I think you'd be uh, curious to learn more about it. Uh, I definitely have an unusual journey. <clears throat> um, I grew up in a firehouse. My dad was a firefighter, and uh, so I saw him kind of giving service to the community. And um, in Colorado, I became an EMT, and it really piqued my interest in medicine. And then uh, I became a volunteer firefighter in Jackson Hole, Wyoming as well. And then uh, one day I was waiting tables and working on a ranch, and uh, I had come across a uh, a co-worker at the restaurant who had just gotten back from med school in the Caribbean and he had kind of talked me into starting uh, the process and uh, he every day we worked together he'd tell me hey Rob you know you really should go do this you should try this you'd be good at it you know I wouldn't tell you know Jeff over there to go do it because I don't think he'd be good at it but knowing you and seeing your inquisitive nature and who you are I think you'll be good So uh, one day I was digging ditches, uh, looking up at the Tetons, and uh, I thought to myself, I'm too too smart to be doing this. So I'm going to apply myself and go to med school. So I uh, didn't really tell anybody, because I was 30-something at this time, 31, 32. And uh, I decided if I get accepted, my life's going to go this way. And if not, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing, having fun, and kind of being a ski bum. And uh, so I got accepted, and here I am. Now I'm, uh, I took kind of an alternate path to get to medical school, and I went to a school in the Caribbean. And uh, then I did uh, a couple different residencies. I did two years of trauma surgery in Las Vegas, and then uh, three years of family medicine up in uh, University of Nevada at Reno. And uh, I landed in Reno, and here I am. Yeah, fantastic. So it sounds like uh, a story similar to uh, a sitcom, and and, and obviously lives uh, for most of us are dramedies. Um, I think it was back in the 90s, something called Going to Extremes. And it was a short-lived sitcom about people that went to the Caribbean to study medicine. Um, And obviously that's no joke because you have to do the same sort of training and and undergo all the same sort of exposure to curriculum uh, prior to matriculating into any uh, postgraduate program, whether it be here or abroad. Um, so that's an amazing uh, journey. So what what clicked in you that you thought about medicine that way? Because it seems as though if somebody comes to you and suggests this as an idea, if you're not already on that path, it's such a broad leap to make from doing basically contractor work a lot of physical labor um, to going into medicine. What was that paradigm shift for you in your head? Well, I don't know a lot of people that were doing construction that suddenly went to medical school. Um, That's a good question. I'm not really sure. (laughs) Um, I just knew I had it in me and I could do it, I think. Um, I I knew I could be successful. And it's funny you say uh, going to extremes. I've pretty much been, I hate to use the term, an extreme athlete, but, you know, I've 
been a climbing guide, a ski patroller, a ski guide. Um, I've skied uh, incredibly insane ski lines and heli skiing in Alaska and Canada and uh, some ski lines in Jackson Hole that, you know, totally would pucker most people and most people would never do it. Um, I've free soloed, you know, 800, 1,000 feet without a rope and kind of, like you said, going to extremes and it just, it didn't seem too extreme for me to go that direction. Um, and uh, having done the medicine and, you know, pseudo medicine as an EMT and then a, a firefighter and I just thought it would be cool to help people. Um, I really actually went to school to become an orthopedic surgeon, but I wasn't cool enough to get in that club. Uh, it's very competitive, and uh, less than one half of one percent of uh, U.S. orthopedic surgeons are from Caribbean schools or from from foreign med schools. So it was kind of had the odds stacked against me. But you know, I rotated through uh, Duke University for ortho, and um, that was really exciting and great and University of North Carolina um, and uh, so I ended up in doing two years of surgery down in Las Vegas because I didn't get into either one of those programs so yeah that's a I mean I think that's a story a lot of uh, uh, professionals in medicine tell is uh, they'll have aspirations to do one form of postgraduate training versus another and I think for uh, the majority of folks I want to say is that they're happy where they end up and and for whatever reason that path unfolds before them and and they end up where they're supposed to be. Now, even more so, and, and I'll talk to you about more specifics uh, around what you're doing now, but even more so, you did a, a little bit of surgery and then you did a primary care residency. So kind of talk to me about what you what you started to do for real work post-residency. Uh, I mean, what where'd you find yourself and, and, and what kind of work were you doing over the past few years? I ended up uh, in residency, I ended up doing what um, a fair amount of residents do to make extra money is moonlighting. Uh, during residency, I started working in a rural hospital in an ER. Uh, ER medicine was always something I was interested in as well um, because it's, it kind of clicks with my personality, you know. Um, turn and burn, have to think on the fly. Um, it's kind of extreme. I, again, I hate to use that term, but it's, uh, it's pretty high risk, high reward. Um, so... Um, and then after residency finished, I continued with the emergency room and I've been doing that since. And then uh, I also did hospitalist work for, um, a year and a half or so directly out of residency. And then, um, uh, just decided to focus on ER for a while. And then, uh, over the course of the last two years or so, um, I found myself drawn towards integrative functional regenerative medicine because I think it's uh, kind of the wave of the future of medicine at this time. Um, I saw some things in medicine that I re in, in regular Western medicine that I uh, thought could be improved upon. So, um, no, that's great. You know, I, I have developed a set of questions here that I, I'm going to try to entertain a lot of the physicians that we have on board because I, I think that it can bring a little bit of the background and a little bit of the picture of where they've been and where they're at and what they find valuable in the arena of medicine. Um, so I want to ask you this. This is um, something that I think uh, about off and on uh, throughout my career. Uh, what is the most profound lesson that you have learned while practicing medicine? I mean, medicine's full of a lot of hard knocks and a lot of hard lessons and some epiphanies. And, and what were some of those like most profound moments for you where you were like, wow, lesson learned here? Uh, I guess humility would probably be the number one um, lesson. Um, no matter how much you think you know, you really don't know much. Um, and the more I learn, the more I learn that how little I actually know. Um, you know, granted, I know a whole lot more about medicine than the layperson. Um, I've, and I've also learned that uh, everybody's different. Um, all patients are different. All doctors are different. Um, humans are different in general. And uh, you have to have a, a, an ability to uh, really connect with patients on a personable level to really have um, an effect on them, basically. I mean, yeah, sure, you can, you know, if someone's got a broken leg, you can throw a rod down their tibia and away they go, and you didn't really have to 
make a connection with it. But if you, as an orthopedic surgeon, you do that and you have a good connection with your patients, um, they're going to recommend you. They're going to like you. Um, if they're going to be less likely to sue you, um, if uh, it's it's very it's I hate to say it, but medicine is a service industry, and it's uh, you have to give good service. Um, like what else was what part of that? Question? Well, I mean, you, you're pretty clear right up front with the concept of uh, having humility. I mean, I think that's a lesson a lot of physicians will learn or have learned, and is extremely important um, because uh, uh, no person uh, is uh, perfect in the in the practice of medicine, and that's why they call it the practice of medicine. So uh, that was uh, excellent. Uh, kind of give me a flavor of any uh, situation or incident that has occurred to you in medicine that sort of left you with that impression that, wow, I really need to be humble. Um, gosh, uh, just, just knowing that, uh, you actually, as a physician have a, a, a deep responsibility to help people and, and not hurt them, you know, um, you know, the first tenet of medicine is do no harm. And uh, it's it's very easy to harm people uh, as a physician or, you know, a healthcare worker, a, so a social worker, anything. When you have that kind of, uh, I don't want to say power, but I guess more of an ability. Um, and, you know, as, as a... As a first-year resident in surgery, my very first... Uh, rotation was call, covering an 800 bed hospital as the night shift guy sitting up in a call room getting calls from you know flo hospital floors uh you know surgery medicine uh the ICU yada 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 and uh I was like you know thrown out of the frying pan into the fire immediately that was I didn't have anyone to talk to to help me and uh so what one of the things I learned real quickly was uh when I didn't know what to do, I, I would ask the nurses, well, what do you guys normally do? <laughs> yeah, no, that's and then, uh, wisdom. Yeah, well, then you have to, you have to quickly, you quickly learn which nurses you can trust and which ones you shouldn't trust. And uh, luckily, uh, again, it goes to humility. If you're, if you're humble, um, the nurses tend to appreciate you a little more. I've never been uh, one of those docs where, like, I put myself on a pedestal and say, well, I'm the doctor and you're the nurse, so you're going to listen to me because that's just a, a really good way to quickly turn any sort of situation into a bad situation and have bad outcomes. Um, you know, learning uh, in the trauma ICU was really, really, really humbling, a very steep learning curve. Um, that was probably one of my favorite. I, I love critical care medicine. Um, as a family doc, you don't really get to do it much, though, because um, you can't do a uh, critical care rotation out of family. It's only internal medicine, which I think should be changed. Um, I think it's kind of a, uh, uh, what's the term? It's kind of a, uh, I don't want to say it's not fair, but it's just, it's not right because there's a lot of really good family medicine doctors who are amazing critical care doctors, but they just uh, don't have that ability in, in the system that we actually currently are in. Yeah, no, I hear that. So we're going to step aside a little bit out of this medicine picture and talk to you a little bit about what sort of either activities or endeavors you pursue outside of your career in medicine and the profession of medicine, and what do you really have a passion for outside of this uh, world of professional health care? I've always been... Uh, into sports and activities um again like uh you and i talked before um when a lot of these docs and intellectual people are, have been sitting inside studying and reading and learning this i was outside playing i was outside riding my bike riding a dirt bike skiing you know spending eight hours hiking up a peak to ski down it um and lately i've um transferred into uh brazilian jiu-jitsu which uh, is for me a mental and physical chess game and um it's it's 
mentally stimulating and it, it's a challenge every day is a challenge and that's i like to be challenged i've, I've figured out um because you know life is life is uh challenging and if you can figure out how to overcome challenges and obstacles uh, a lot of times it can make it easier when you have a really big hurdle or obstacle obstacle to overcome um i love making music um some of the music on this podcast is uh, what i've made um, I've played guitar, bass, piano, um, make electronic music. Um, I find that uh, sometimes the uh, practice of medicine it can be uh, overwhelming, so people don't get to go outside and uh, outside of medicine and be creative. Um, even though you can be very creative as a physician in certain aspects, but uh, the uh, the creativity of making music has really helped me uh, get through some tough times in the last couple of years. No, oh, it's great. Well, let's uh, continue on down this path and let's talk about what is your best medicine. What do you do to really take care of yourself, uh, whether it be within your family unit or, or on your own? Um, I have, I've always been into uh, diet and exercise. I think those two things. Um, are the most important things you could do uh, physically um, and then uh, for spiritually, emotionally. Um, I've been uh, practicing meditation for the last um, four or five years, kind of trying to be pretty serious about it. It's tough, it's tough to, to really uh, practice. It's tough to learn. Again, it's a steep learning curve. Um, meditation is not as easy as someone would think. Um, I actually was lucky in high school. I had, uh, I went to a private Catholic high school and we had a teacher and a religion class, uh, freshman year. And every week he'd start off with a uh, silent meditation. It was awesome. Yeah, that's good. Um, but again, it goes back to, uh, diet and exercise. And, you know, you learned in med school, uh, before you just throw someone on prescription medications, you should try diet and lifestyle modifications right so yeah um that's uh what i try to do try to be healthy and i try to tell all my patients that you know it's all about what you put in your mouth it's um do you exercise I ask a lot of my patients do you exercise and a lot of them say no um i've, I've had patients say well i have a, a gym membership i'm like well do you use it nope so um, another one of the things that I think is really, really important is uh, discipline. And uh, that one word is uh, very profound. Um, you know, Jocko Willink says that uh, discipline equals freedom. And what do you think he means by that? Uh, when you are, have discipline, um, you have freedom to do things that you otherwise wouldn't have time to do, such as uh, you and I have recently discussed about getting up at 5.30 in the morning. Um, it's really easy to lay in bed when that alarm goes off and snooze and snooze and snooze. If you get up early, guess what? You just found yourself an extra 30, 40 minutes throughout the day. Um, and discipline equals freedom when it comes to choosing diet. Um, I've been pretty aggro on the paleo diet for the last year and a half almost. Um, and because of it, uh, I'm healthier. And so I have the discipline to do it. Um, I have the discipline not to smoke cigarettes. Um, I have the discipline not to, um, you know, do drugs. Um, and it gives you a freedom. Um, a, a lot of those things I just said are actually forms of slavery. Um, and uh, so if you can have discipline, you can have the freedom. It, it, it goes to... Uh, lots of different aspects time health uh emotional freedom um if you if you're disciplined it makes makes overcoming obstacles easier i think okay so no that's uh that is wise that, that's, that's a tough question to answer but uh i you know when i heard that it, it just resonated with me immediately um yeah you know i mean i think the counterpoint to that is a lot of people consider uh discipline 
um, sort of the antithesis to their freedom because a lot of people say, well, if I must follow X, Y, and Z rule to be quote unquote disciplined, they couldn't be free. And that's why I was curious for me to hear your explanation. And I see the point. It's sort of a, a downstream uh, phenomenon where the freedom is exhibited or expressed or enjoyed after the discipline is demonstrated. Absolutely. Like if you have the discipline to make it through, you know, med school, you're going to have some you know, financial freedom, hopefully afterwards, you're going to have a freedom, the freedom of actually practicing medicine. They don't just give that away. No, sure. Thank goodness. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll get back to medicine a little bit here. Give me uh, kind of in your opinion, what are we doing right in healthcare today? I, the healthcare uh, industry, unfortunately, is that an industry and it's really dominated by a lot of um, business uh, operators. So talk to me about uh, your opinion on healthcare um, and kind of what is uh, looking good in that arena. I think uh, people looking outside the box of the standard, you know, uh, I, I don't want to bag on anything in particular, but, you know, pharmaceutical medicine, you, you know, you have uh, high blood pressure, so we're just going to give you some antihypertensives. Um, I, I've recently learned about functional and integrative medicine, and to me, that's getting to the root cause of the problem. Instead of just putting a Band-Aid on something, I'm actually going to try to get to the cause of your high blood pressure and uh, change it. And then that way, you're not going to have to take medications. Uh, in, in my opinion, the less medications in life, the better. And same thing with surgery. The less surgeries in life, the better. Um, and I, I, there's kind of an awakening going on with a lot of patients and uh, practitioners that are stepping outside of the typical business model that medicine is these days. Um, you know, thank goodness we have um, great emergency rooms. If you get hit by a bus, you're going to go to the nearest emergency room and hopefully get saved. Thank goodness we have surgery if, if you need an appendectomy or if you need, um, you know, an intramedullary rod in your tibia. Thank goodness for that. Um, the uh, what I see, it, like I said, it's an awakening. There's people kind of starting to think outside the box, including um, nutrition and supplements and things like that. Um, so, you, so you see sort of a strength in our technology when it comes to critical care, and, and you also see some strength in the fact that we're opening our eyes to some other opportunities uh, within the field, the broad field of medicine. Absolutely, absolutely, okay. yep. So what do you think uh, needs to be improved in healthcare? You, you sort of hinted at a few things here in your prior comments. Well, let us know what you think could be made better. I think uh, it needs to be more personable. Um, it needs to be more of the um, very intimate doctor-patient relationship. Um, one of the things that we're lucky that we get to do, because uh, we're not constrained by time, uh, oftentimes I know both you and I, our, our first patient intake is uh, hour and a half almost. Um, so we, I could sit there and listen to my patients and, uh, that to me is a, a, a strength. Um, a lot of patients recently have said to me, wow, you're the first doctor that actually just sits there and listens to me. Um, so, and I, th I think unfortunately the current model in medicine is, uh, because it's, a, it's pharmaceutically driven, and B, it's insurance driven, is that uh, you got to see as many patients as you can. You know, I, I, I grew up waiting tables and uh, bartending, and, you know, you could either work in a really nice high-end restaurant where you saw less people, you served less people that night, but you had a higher check average and usually a more uh, rewarding interaction, or you could work in a place where you turn and burn, and the more people you see, the more money you make. And... You know, unfortunately, the um, current model, the majority of the model in the U.S., from what I think and see, is that it's kind of a turn and burn model. Um, and I don't want to be part of that. I mean, I don't, I can do that. And if I'm, you know, working in the ER or the hospital, I, I can do that. And But I still try to make it as personable as possible. Um, you know, working in the ERs, I've had patients ask me, well, do you have a, a practice outside? I'd really like to have you be my doctor. And I, I believe it's just because they see that I'm personable and I can talk to them and I can, I can uh, reach them on a personal level. And so I, I think, unfortunately, that is, has been lost in not only medicine, but uh, the service industry as a whole, 
uh, the restaurant industry, any type of service industry where, you know, I mean, if you go get your, your clothes dry cleaned and you know, they burn a hole in your clothes or something, they're like, oh, sorry, we're not responsible. <laughs> so... Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, parallels uh, outside of the healthcare industry, which you're right, you stated earlier, it is a service industry. And uh, it's very important for us to acknowledge the fact that we are providing a service. Uh, and there's a recipient of that service and how that exchange takes place is of paramount importance. Um, let's uh, talk a little bit about where you see the field of medicine going in the next, say, 25 to 50 years. I, I know that's like, you know, basically a career length uh, in distance, um, but a lot has changed in the past 25 to 50 years. Where do you think we're going? Oh, I think it's going to be uh, a lot of genetics, um, like we were talking about before. Uh, CRISPR Cas9. We're gonna we're gonna be able to get rid of diseases through uh, gene engineering. Um, I think stem cells are the wave of the future of medicine as well for regenerative medicine. Um, I I don't think that uh, the intimate personal um, doctor-patient relationship is going to change and I, I, I hope it's going to actually even improve and um, become more uh, central and more key to people's health care um, you know a lot of times people just come to the doctors because they need someone to talk to and they want someone to listen to them um, I've seen that in the ERs I've seen that in the hospitals I've seen that in uh, my integrative practice people just want someone to talk to um, you know, hopefully we're going to um, shy away from um, more pharmaceuticals and do more uh, naturopathic medicine uh, supplements. Um, we're going to, I hopefully we're going to focus on um, nutrition. Um, you know, nutrition is the number one um, modality. I think that's going to help make us healthier. And unfortunately. Um, the standard American diet and the food supply in the U.S. is uh, less than desirable at this point. And I think what I do see is a lot of people doing uh, home gardens. Um, you know, you can even if you live in an apartment, you can do a you know five-gallon bucket garden on your on your patio and eat wholesome, nutritious foods. And so. Um, where medicine's going in the next 25 to 50 years, I have no idea, but I hope it continues to improve. Yeah, no, absolutely. I agree. Uh, so what pearl of medical wisdom would you like to leave our listeners with today? I think a uh, chance for folks to listen to physicians, uh, it comes uh, once in a while. And if you have a pearl that you could pass on, I think it'd be uh, worth listening to. Um, you know, have discipline. Um and uh, look for a doctor that's going to sit down and listen to you and listen to what you have to say about your health care and possibly your uh, your needs because, um, again, it goes back to, yeah, it is a service industry, and we are providing a service. And, you know, that's one thing I do enjoy is being in service of uh, the community, trying to make the world a better place. I know it sounds kind of corny, but I really true truly uh, am trying to make the world a better place one one patient at a time fantastic well i think we'll leave it on that dr floyd you've been phenomenal with sharing your information we learned a lot about you i've even learned more about you even though i've been practicing with you for a few years now i want to thank all of our listeners out there uh, for turning on the medicine wheel we appreciate you and we love to hear uh, back from you in the future please share us uh, some of your stories, and if you want to learn more about any of the providers that are part of the Medicine Wheel, please contact us. All right, and check out uh, themedicinewheel.org. Thanks. Absolutely. Appreciate it. The Medicine Wheel encourages all of our listeners to subscribe to our newsletter and podcasts as we continue to explore the world of medicine, bringing you up-to-date health and science information. The Medicine Wheel invites our listeners to email us any newsworthy stories or topics they wish to explore further and discuss on the podcast. For more information about the Medicine Wheel, please visit us at our website, www.themedicinewheel.org, and on Facebook, and finally on Twitter and Instagram at The Med Wheel.
In an effort to support access to integrative medicine and functional medicine options for those in need and education for those who need information, please consider donating to Project Omcare, 501c3.org. Please go to our website, www.themedicinewheel.org, to learn more. Thank you again to all our local sponsors. Grateful Gardens, Lighthouse Coffee, and Dorinda's Chocolates, which represent some of the best organic and appetizing options in the Reno Tahoe area. Lighthouse Coffee Shop is a proud sponsor of the Medicine Wheel. We are a family owned and operated local coffee shop. Our goal as a business and a family is to cultivate community wherever we are. All of our coffee is ethically sourced, organic, and farm fresh. It's roasted in-house daily, guaranteeing you access to the freshest cup of coffee on the planet. We care deeply for our community and everyone in it. We strive to provide you with the best ingredients and most comfortable environment. Come and enjoy coffee with us. We are family and we would love for you to be part of it. Gerber Medical Clinic is proud to support the Medicine Wheel and medical education to improve health quality, nurturing the lifestyles of our listening community, enhancing wellness for all. Thanks again to Wired Insights and their talented team for making our podcasting dream possible. In closing, we would like to remind all of our listeners, if you have a medical concern or diagnosis, you need to see your personal doctor without delay, and if needed, obtain a referral to a specialist. If ever you feel the health issue you have is urgent or an emergency, please call 911 and go to your nearest emergency room. Please do not take any of our physician's commentary or our guest's opinion as medical advice, and always seek out medical care from fully licensed and appropriately trained medical professionals in your area. The information shared in this podcast is for general information only and should not be construed as medical advice and understand that no doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and educational materials linked to this podcast and website are employed at the user's own risk. The content of this podcast is not meant to be used as a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. This is the Medicine Wheel signing off for this week with a reminder to live, love, listen, and learn.